What's up, Facebook? Happy Monday. Opening a clutch box. Let's do a little unboxing here. How are you guys doing on this Monday? I've had a hell of a day, so sorry if I'm a little moody. But uh, Mondays are always busy for us here at Clay Smith. And um, today was extra busy. So here we go. Here is a polar clutch made by Terminator. Um, so you can kind of see the, the initial difference here. You can see there's uh, some ramps in there. You got some weights and some rollers. You got your sheave where the belt goes. See that? And this one's gonna look pretty similar to the Shockwave. You know, you got a roller driven instead of buttons. Okay, so let's kind of dive right into this. Um, the Polar Clutch is probably the most complicated clutch there is that you could run on a Junior Dragster. Um, it's got the most moving parts. Uh, the front unit is uh, mostly made up of, you know, three clutch ramps. Um, and then uh, you got a clutch spring, a primary clutch spring. And then you got um, weights on each arm. So, uh, you know, with the three ramps you have arms that fly out against the ramps and those arms have weights and rollers on them and um, so the basic principle of the clutch is the way that you're loading the motor is all in the the weights on the arms and the clutch ramps so i'm going to bust this little primary unit apart and i'll show you how to do that in just a second So it's easy to just take a uh, an impact here. This is a barrel lock. I'm just gonna take that, that loose. See how I didn't unscrew it all the way? So this is kind of a little code here. This will make it easier to get the clutch can off. I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. All right, I'm back. My rubber mallet was out in the shop. So again, we got the uh, the barrel lock unscrewed about halfway. And then you're gonna take your rubber mallet and just pop the top of that barrel lock. And then you can screw it the rest of the way off. So now we have the clutch can that holds the ramps. So this would be called the uh, ramp holder off the clutch. And what we have is, you know, the, the spider and the rollers and the arms and everything. Um, you can see the spring in there, that's a purple spring. So this unit actually just slides right off the post. So you can see we got three, three pieces, okay? out of the primary so you got your fixed post here it's got a sheave on it you got your primary clutch can it's got the ramps and then you got your movable sheave that's got the uh, spider and the clutch arms and the rollers okay so now that we got the three pieces apart which is half the battle here if you haven't messed with one um, Let's dive into how this thing works. Okay, so 
you got your ramps in here that have angles on them. These angles, you know, we'd almost have to take one out. But these angles here basically control the load and the, you know, the load on the motor and, and the, um, you know, I guess they kind of control everything. Basically, these are the brain of the clutch. I mean, that's, that's a pretty good way to put it. So these clutch ramps are the brain of the clutch. So if you want to manipulate how your engine's loading or how your engine is hitting the tire aggressively or whatever, this ramp, changing this ramp and changing its profile can move those things around for you. Um, but the polar clutch basically started its life on a snowmobile and the snowmobile guys loved them because, you know, they're a simple clutch and um, they're very tunable. So, you know, this particular clutch right out of the box has a, uh, and most ramps have the numbers on the sides of them. This clutch has a 152822. So that means it has a 15 degree. The, the first number is always the, the stall angle, which is the, um, the top part of the ramp. And that, that is a 15 degree. And then uh, the second number is the first angle after it leaves the stall angle. And that is 28 degrees. And then you have a 22. So this is what we call a three stage ramp. I mean, it is, it is very um, kind of a cookie cutter uh, ramp combination here. Um, this, this ramp will actually work in 890 and 790 pretty well. Um, you know, get you down the track. You can manipulate the uh, arm weight to kind of get it to where you, you want on the RPMs for the clutch load. But um, this is basically your standard, you know, clutch setup for kind of get you going, get you down the track. Now, with the Polar Clutch, you have an unlimited amount of ramp choices. So, for example, if you are not happy with the 15, 28, 22, like, uh, and how aggressive, like maybe it's just driving off the starting line, or maybe it's not um, kind of what you expected it to be, you know, as far as how the graph looks, you know, you're kind of like, you got a shockwave guy out there and he's showing off his nice flat graph and everything. Well, you know, you can do that too with a, a polar clutch. You just have to get the combination of the weights and the ramp right. So, you know, a 15, uh, 28, 22 on a 790 car, um, you know, might not be enough ramp. Um, you can make it enough ramp if you put a lot of clutch weight on it. You can see this thing's probably got, you know, this is considered a clutch weight. This is considered a clutch weight. So when you pull these bolts out, and you, you know, you disassemble this arm and you remove the clutch weight, you will be able to weigh these two weights and, you know, on the gram scale. And when you weigh those two weights, you'll have a number like 10 grams. Okay, let's just throw that as an example. So, you know, you have to make each one of these arms have the same amount of weight on them. So this arm's gonna have 10 grams, this arm's gonna have 10 grams, this arm's gonna have 10 grams for a total of 30 grams. Um, and what we found playing with this clutch for as many years as we have, you know, each gram is like about 150 RPMs. So if you got this clutch combination here and you are running, you know, say uh, a peak RPM of 8,500, and you're wanting to drag it down to 8,400, you know you need to put at least a gram worth of counterweight on each arm. So that's kind of the cool thing on this clutch is, you know, that you really can't achieve uh, achieve with a shockwave is, um, you know, the shockwave, you're just limited to changing the counterweight. Um, and, and that's pretty much it by the flyweight. This one with this ramp, you can change and manipulate the load as you go down the racetrack. So the shock waves are getting to that point if, if they introduce the multi-angle helixes and stuff like that, they can kind of change the, the load as, as the clutch cycles. But, um, you know, this polar, 
you know, is so cool because you got so many years of vendors developing ramps and helixes and, and springs and all kinds of different combinations for you guys to just go wild with. Um, so each vendor, uh, half scale, uh, Huddleston, um, Choo Choo, uh, Blossom, you know, myself, we all have an unlimited amount of ramps and helixes, uh, you know, and, and springs and belts and, and different components for the inside. Um, but one word of advice, you know, if you guys are going to mess with one of these polar style clutches is to um, definitely buy your clutch parts from one vendor because there's been so many iterations of this thing that, you know, if you go in and try to mix choo-choo clutch parts in with a Terminator clutch, like this is considered a Terminator, um, you, you may not get the results you're expecting because the tolerances are just a little different in everybody's, everybody's uh, you know, different clutch. So if you got a Choo Choo clutch, buy your parts from Choo Choo. If you got a Huddleston clutch, I recommend buying your parts from Huddleston. Uh, if you got a Terminator, same thing. Uh, Blossom, you know the deal. So, um, but you know, it, it's a pretty simple design. Uh, another cool thing that you can't do with the shockwave, but you can do with the polar, is you can see inside this can here, it's got a square, uh, you know, slot for the post to slide on. So there's there's shims that are made out there that go right on top of this post and into this clutch can, which space the ramp and the roller relationship differently to kind of manipulate the RPM launch uh, and the kids' R, uh, reaction time. So. You know, those things are pretty neat. Uh, you can't really do that with a shockwave. Um, you know, you can manipulate this air gap. If you spin this post off this uh, sheave, you can put some shim in between these two, and that changes your air gap distance. That's kind of helpful for guys that want to manipulate different things in their graph. Um, you know, the, the spring comes off pretty easily. You just go and do those Allen bolts around the perimeter of that spider. And you can change to multiple different color springs with different tensions to kind of change RPM also. Um, you know, again, it's just it's just unlimited. You can you can kind of fiddle dick this thing to death, and and some people enjoy that, some people want the simplicity, and I think there's a customer for each one. Um, you know, I probably sell, you know, I would say for every you know five engines that I sell. I probably only sell one of these style clutches. Um, you know, it, it, it seems to be a lot easier for a guy to get up and go um, with a shockwave style clutch. But then I have customers that, you know, are into looking at their graph and they want to make it just how they, you know, think they need it to be. And uh, the Polar is definitely the clutch that, that you got to have if you want it, you know, to be a certain way. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's basically the primary unit. Uh, I apologize for the air. They, we're still kind of working. We're, we're off in another probably 15 minutes. But um, do you guys have any questions so far? I mean, I it's late in the day, so I'm trying to cover this the best I can. And I see a lot of you guys watching this. So um, any questions so far on the Polar Clutch? Any questions on this thing? You know, I know you all are interested in it because you've asked for it. So... So again, it goes on just like this. See, slides right on top of there. And then you just gotta make sure you align the, you go back in line with the rollers on the ramps. If you misalign this this can on this, uh, this clutch, you will destroy uh, this clutch. Uh, you have to make sure that when you put the can back on the spider and, um, you know, try to put it back together, that you go directly back in line with the, uh, ramps. So the rollers have to be in line with the ramps to, to put this clutch back together. Okay. Justin Miller. Thank you. Um, so Justin Miller says, I'm curious on how they reset the clutch at the starting line. Sorry, I'm new to this. Justin, that's an awesome question. Thank you. Um, so in a nutshell, the, the 
resetting the clutch is only really necessary if the clutch has been locked in. So, you know, being that this is a centrifugal clutch, so it works off of RPM. So the higher the RPM goes, depending on how this thing's set up, the closer you're gonna be to getting in contact the belt with the shiv here. So after your burnout, sometimes if you're running a close setup, you will um, basically need to toggle the on and off switch to get it to release again and kind of, that's what they call resetting the clutch. So it's more kind of setup related. A lot of the more basic setups, like this out of the box setup, you probably won't need to reset it. But as you develop your, uh, you know, your clutch setup and you make things tighter and closer, you know, to, you know, your, your launch RPM and bring everything, you know, tight to where when, when your kid nails the throttle, there's no lag, you know, there's no converter flash. It just kind of go. So, you know, if those setups are that way, then it would require a toggle before you let your kid go in there and stage. Um, and you do notice probably a lot of people push their cars back, you know, uh, in the procedure. That's kind of been a thing that people do. And all you're really doing with that is if the belt is a little too tight on this rear clutch and the car is moving forward, you know, you will drop you will drop that belt down slightly in the rear. And if you move the car back just a tickle, it should bring that belt back up to the top. But really, you know, pushing the car back um, is kind of become a little bit a, of a monkey see, monkey do deal. Um, you know, if your belt tension is right and your, your spring is tight back there, it should not drop the, uh, the belt down. So, you know, we always had to do it in the 330 stuff because we were putting everything on the edge, you know, and the belt tension's tight and the helix is, is got a really fast ramp on it. Um, so, you know, we found it to be a little better for us to push the cars back. Um, hopefully that answers your question, Justin. Almost got my wife talked into letting me get one of those pretty 790 motors. Timmy, I'd love to have you as a customer. You keep working on your wife. I'd be happy to build you one. Uh, Darren, what kind of maintenance should we be doing on the clutch? Uh, is that what you're asking, Darren? Clutch maintenance? Uh, okay, so that's easy. So maintenance is really going to be pretty much all in the front unit. And um, what we see here uh, that kind of goes bad with the polar, you see, see this bronze bushing here? So that builds up with clutch debris, uh, belt debris mostly. And you got to get in there with some scotch right here and there and, and get that back, you know, nice and shiny and good to go. So that's, in my opinion, the probably the number one thing that people miss on the Polar is making sure that that's clean and smooth. Because if that's not clean and smooth and you're trying to get this thing, you know, consistent, that, remember, this, this sheave has to go through that bushing. So... We got to make sure there's not a big build up there or it can't really push in that great and smooth. The other thing is just kind of keeping an eye on your maintenance would be just keeping an eye on your, on your in play on the, on the, uh, you know, the arms here. See, this one has zero side to side in play. You know, as the clutch wears, you'll get more. Um, and then the, the rollers, you can see that, you know, this is what the ramp rolls against. Uh, it's called a clutch roller. So over time, those will start to wear out. Um, but yeah, other than that, your, your, you know, your run to run maintenance is just keeping this surface clean with acetone um, because you are gonna get a little belt debris on both, uh, both shiv surfaces. So, you know, that's pretty much it. And always wipe down your belt, you know, just kind of the same deal as like you guys are expecting to do on the shock waves. You make sure your belt's clean and the shivs are clean that's pretty much it on on the run to run maintenance let's kind of look at some more questions here explain air gap okay air gap is the distance Bye. okay see you tomorrow the distance between your sheave and your belt but you got to make sure you got some pressure against the movable sheave. So just, you know, you stick a feeler gauge in between 
you know, the, the belt and the fixed sheave. So it's kind of hard. I don't have four hands, but you know, when we used to do this with the outlaw car, I'd kind of basically put this in a vise and then, um, you know, I'd have the feeler gauges go in, you know, right here. So feeler gauges go in between, you know, the sheave. The, you don't want to put it on the movable sheave. This is the movable sheave. You want to bring some tension to that sheave, and then you want to shove your feeler gauges on the fixed sheave, in between the fixed sheave and the belt. You should have about, I mean, depending on, like if you're running a, a stiff belt like this, you can run a, uh, a little tighter air gap, okay? Um, I, I would probably run this belt. This belt is not flexible. This is a stiff belt. This belt here, I'd, I'd look for somewhere between maybe like 15 and 25 thousandths. You couldn't go any tighter than 15. Um, 15 is, is absolute the tightest you can put it. Um, if you're running a flimsier belt, like a one that's really flexible and everything, you can go all the way out to about 50, 60 thousandths with the flimsy ones. So hopefully that answers your guys' questions. All right. Okay, so if we don't have any other questions on the polar clutch, I know that was kind of a simple, fast, fast and dirty um, ex explanation on the polar. Um, but I did have a question yesterday on um, EGT, you know, and, and what, what guys should look for on how to tune their car with the uh, EGT probe. And I had a guy ask me, hey man, what 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 is what is the EGT number need to be at the end of the racetrack? Well, holy hell, that's like an impossible thing to answer. And, and that's kind of like hard to explain, but I'm gonna do my best to explain it. Um, so, uh, okay, let's, let's answer, I'll answer that uh, clutch belt question in just a minute. Um, but I'm gonna get back to this EGT thing. So this EGT, what what EGT should I run um, with a 790 motor? What should I be looking for at the end of the track? Okay, the simplest way I can put that is your buddy's EGT and your EGT and your neighbor's EGT are all gonna be different. There is no magic number that you should be at the end of the track that's gonna maximize your performance on your junior dragster. What I look for on my stuff is I look at the starting line EGT and the finish line EGT and I take those two numbers and I minus them. So if you're 1200 degrees on the uh, finish line EGT and you are 600 degrees on the starting line, that means you have a 600 degree build in temperature. Um, on a 790 car or one of my motors, um, your range needs to be somewhere between 500 and 550 degrees. So that's a baseline EGT gain that you guys should be looking for to tune your race cars. Um, so hopefully that helps you guys. Uh, you know, if, if you're 1050 on the EGT, but you've built 550 degrees, you're pretty close on your tune-up if that makes any sense. So um, the, basically the hotter you leave the starting line, sometimes the, the harder it is to um, get your spread right because the motor does not like to build EGT at the other end when it leaves too hot. And you'll see that. I mean, I've experienced it. Um, I don't really know how to explain it, but it, it is what happens when, when say you leave it like 900 degrees on the um, EGT or, or maybe 850, um, you, you'll find that, you know, you may only be, um, you know, 1050 or 1150, you know, you're not gonna be as hot as you should be at the other end if you start off hotter. I don't get it, but that's just how it works. Okay, uh, we're gonna go back to some clutch questions now. Um, what brand belt is good belt for a polar clutch? I, it, you know, 
I'm not going to go sit here and tell you which belt is the best belt or which who you should buy your belts from or whatever. Um, I personally think you guys need to experiment on your own on the belts. If you're going to ask my opinion on which one I personally like, it's the stiffer ones because you can run them longer and you don't need to replace them. So, good night, Evan. Good night. Okay. So, um, if you run the flimsier belts, they are going to grab easier and kind of like jerk the car out of the beams because they don't slip. So, when you're basically going to get ready to, you know, hit the belt with the sheaves, the softer belt grabs good, you know, but with the better grab belt, it becomes a, a you know, a faster wearing belt. So, you know, that means you need to have freaking 10 of them in the trailer ready on deck. You know, as you wear those things down, they even become more aggressive because the air gap gets bigger. So when you wear the sides of this belt down, your air gap is going to increase. And if you're trying to maintain an air gap, you know, because you want to keep your kids reaction time the same and the car launch the same and everything, the soft belt probably is not a good, a good deal. We ran the soft belt in 330, you know, all out format because we're looking to hit the tire as hard as we can, you know, so that belt, that belt moved the car out of the beams the fastest. Um, but there were tracks and stuff that we raced at that didn't have good starting lines that, you know, we ran these stiffer belts and, and we could slide the car off the line and not hit the tire as hard. And that, that, you know, that belt works good. So you know, everybody's branding their own belt. Cross got a belt. Uh, Half Skills got a belt. The the Junior Dragster Parts guys got a belt. Um, Terminator has belts. Uh, shit, everybody I think has belts. So pick a vendor you guys like. I mean, it can be anybody, and buy your belts from from them. Um, you know, I sell belts. I don't really advertise it that I sell them, but I have them um, for my local customers and and stuff. But yeah, I mean, the the belts are run a stiff one. You you'll you'll thank me. Run a stiff belt. Uh, what causes a belt to turn inside out when letting off after the run? That's a great question, Mike. Um, from my experience, it's when the belt hits the bottom of the uh, the pins on the rear clutch. When it hits the bottom of the pins, see the pins down there, the three pillar pins. When the belt goes down and hits those pins, it does some wonky shit. Um, and typically, it basically is so far down on the rear, and it hits the pins, and it kind of jerks it, and it throws it off the front. Um, you know, it, it has to throw it off the front to turn it. But typically, it does it only when it hits the pins uh, down there. So the, the taller belts that people are selling you guys that are taller, you're going to be more likely to hit the pins down at the bottom. So keep kind of keep an eye on those taller belts. I, I don't really recommend the super, super tall belts. Uh, Haddock's sewn some of those. And, and I think if you don't run a lot of gear or something, you should be okay. But, um, you know, just keep an eye on the super tall belts because you'll flip them. And I've seen some JR belts flip. Uh, you know, I think if they put the wrong pillars in there, you know, because JR makes a... Uh, a short and a long uh, pillar um, for their standard clutch and then they have their overdrive clutch. So sometimes they're mix matching those rear clutches. Uh, I think they're a lot better on that now, but if you have the wrong one, uh, it'll, it'll flip it. How do we measure belts? This is my little junior dragster calipers. Measure the belts just like this. You measure the side width, okay? So you can measure it in a few spots. Just so you guys know, these new belts are going to vary probably five, five to ten thousandths, okay? Um, not a big deal. This is going to take a couple runs to true it up. But once it trues up, you should leave it because if you got a true belt, you know, that measure is starting to measure, you know, pretty much the same in different spots. That's going to be the most consistent clutch belt. Okay, so a new one is going to vary, but you got to put a couple runs on it and it'll true itself up by running. And then, um, you know, once you get a few runs on it, it'll be nice and true and it'll measure the same and, 
you should start to expect some consistency from that. But it is going to take a couple runs. And you can cherry pick belts. I mean, if you got a guy that that you're buying belts from and, and you're anal and you tell him, hey, I, I really want to try a, uh, to, to buy some belts that are a little closer than 10 thousandths on the variance when I measure the sides, most vendors will work with you on that. Um, is a fat belt better than a skinny one? Uh, it really doesn't matter. I mean, it's, if, if you have your tolerances set for a small belt or a skinny belt, um, you know, I would say the fat belt is going to probably make more low gear because you're going to have to have it higher on the rear clutch. You know, you got to remember the wider the belt, the higher it's going to sit on the back. And the higher it sits on the back, the more low gear you're going to have. The more low gear you're going to have is the harder it's going to hit the tire. I just came in on a comment, keeping the sheaves clean with acetone. What do you clean your belt with? Yeah, acetone. Um, acetone is going to be probably the only uh, cleaner that you can use that isn't going to have some type of additive in with it, like solvents and stuff. Um, if you're in a pinch, of course, you know, use brake cleaner or whatever. But uh, if you keep acetone in your trailer, that's what you should be cleaning your clutch with for sure. Um, okay, it is getting to be a little late here. Is there any other questions on this before we kind of kick this off for tonight? I know this was kind of a quick and dirty uh, polar clutch video here, um, but maybe we can start with this one and kind of go from there if you guys need to hear more things about it. Um, what is a normal overdrive for a 790? That's just dependent on the gear ratio. I mean, if you guys are running like a five and a half to one gear ratio, um, you know, I would think somewhere around 15% or so, 10 to 15% would be pretty normal. Um, but again, I mean, that depends on your belt width too. If you got a wider belt and you're starting off with uh, the belt higher on the rear clutch, you're going to have more low gear. So with more low gear is going to be more overdrive. Um, it, basically, it's a combination of just math. I mean, you have to take your rear clutch diameter into your rear end gear ratio and that basically will tell you the overdrive of what you should expect your overdrive should be. Um, so like when we were running Outlaw 330 and you know, this is a seven inch rear driven, so seven inch and OD. So when we tried seven and a quarters, you know, that made the clutch cycle quicker and made it go one to one quicker. And then, you know, Haddock kind of had a harebrained idea that when we did the little motors that we were gonna make because the little motors didn't make any power down low, we were going to make a seven and a half uh, rear driven. And, you know, that one was just way too much. So anywhere from like a six and three quarter to a seven and a quarter OD is pretty optimum for eighth mile racing. Um, so hopefully that helps. God, there's a lot of people listening in tonight. Uh, just kind of looking around for some more questions here. I don't want to miss any of you guys before I uh, sign off. Um, yeah, I hope that EGT uh, that EGT question kind of got answered good. Um, hopefully it makes you guys think a little bit and start backing into that math. You really need to look at that finish line EGT and the starting line and start tracking um, those differences. And even if you want to take a peek at the 330, you know, and, and track the difference from the 330 to the 660 and, and keep that uh, difference also. Um, I kind of don't even look at cylinder head. I think you could probably just take that off the car. Um, some guys really dwell on it. Um, when we ran 330 uh, really competitively out here, we I never even had a, a cylinder head temp gauge. I, I, I kind of think for bracket racing, you know, guys guys just fixate on that cylinder head and, and maybe I'm just weird or whatever, but I just don't, I don't think you need to put a lot of thought into it. I mean, your EGT will be, uh, you know, right when it's right. And your cylinder head will be a result of that. I mean, when your EGT is at the right temp on the starting line, your cylinder head, you know, is going to be 
whatever it is. I mean, it, you know, it, if that's 140 degrees, if that's 180 degrees, I don't, you know, the, the end result is the EGT. That's what's coming out the pipe. So, you know, your cylinder head is, is basically, you know, it's like, in my opinion, like checking the, like the heat on the oven, you know, like we're going to put something in the oven and we're going to heat it up, you know, and, and we're going to put something in when, or we're going to, we're going to take it out when, when it gets to a certain temp. Um, yeah, I don't think we need to race like that. Look at your exhaust gas temperature. Okay. So does pipe size matter? Okay. Exhaust pipe. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Exhaust pipe does matter. Um, if you got too small of one, you'll have a choppier idle. If you have too big of one, you won't have any back pressure to pull on the carburetor. Um, pipe on these flatheads is really important. We've kind of figured it out with the dyno and, and different stuff, but um, really the, the biggest change is, is the primary tube diameter. So the first stage, if the first stage is too small, like I said, it's going to be choppy. The idle quality will be choppy. If the first stage is too big and you have a big port and a big motor, you may have an issue with stumbling or, or whatever because you got no back pressure to pull on the carburetor. So it, there's a fine line with the headers, and I think we're pretty close on them. And then the stages, of course, manipulate the RPM range of where the motor is going to make power at. So the primary is pretty important um, for the hit of throttle. Um, hopefully that answers your guys' question. Um Yes. Does temp sensor size matter? Yeah. So that, that straight EGT and the 90 EGT read completely different. So the straight EGT, in my opinion, is kind of like a lower cost unit. It's like what comes with the Micron. Um, they, they screw up more often. They, they read wrong more often. Um, if you guys really want good quality EGTs, uh, you need to run the 90 degree, um, you know, EGT probe, they're a little bit more money, but they're way less likely to fail and they're way more accurate. So you will notice that the straight EGT uh, will read colder than the 90 degree open tip. Um, it's just kind of how they work. I, 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 you know, like I said, when we raced, we always ran the 90 degree true EGT brand EGT probe. So, and then we only shoved it in, you know, like I, it's got to be between half and, and probably like three eighths of an inch into the pipe, you know, so like be about halfway or just slightly, you know, before halfway and, and you know, that, and that's perfect. And then you're saying EGT location. Um, so of course the closer you get the EGT, um, to the port, you know, the, the, the difference, you know, it, it may read, but I would say uh, somewhere between, you know, from the center line of the valve to where you want the probe, you need to be probably about six to eight inches is probably a, a pretty good ballpark number. So each block, you know, casting and, and everything is different. But, you know, we've kind of standardized that a little bit, you know, with all of us using kind of one guy to build the headers. Um, so he's been putting them in uh, a pretty consistent spot and i think it's been working really well so um okay so it is uh getting pretty late you guys i appreciate y'all watching and um sorry we couldn't do it last night jordan came home from being gone for a week on vacation and she was going to cook dinner but we ended up having pizza and now she's cooking dinner tonight and i'm already supposed to be home so it was good talking to you all tonight. Here's a smile for Chris Ratchford. And uh, Chris, I hope you guys are doing okay and, and uh, get well soon, man.